but it was a fabulous sort of trashy. It was like I'm having such a good time and I don't care how I look. You know, that was the version of trashy that I liked. Hello, I am Kay Anderson and you are listening to Lost Spaces, a podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there, and the people that they used to know. Katie Underwood came to fame in the year 2000, following her appearance on the first series of Australian pop stars and her subsequent role in the band that was formed on the series, Bardo. Think of like a much cooler hearsay. Since that time, she has branched out into dance music and was a mainstay on the clubbing scene in the noughties. We caught up to discuss The Market, a club on Commercial Road in Piran in Melbourne. So, the market. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's just, I, I, so much happened to me at and around the market. That's why I'm laughing. I'm just embracing myself for all of the stuff I'm possibly about to confess. That's why, it's nervous laughter. That's what this is. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm nervous. But, yes, the market, the iconic gay venue of, of uh, Commercial Road, previously known as Three Faces for many, many years uh, for those older than me. Yeah. yeah. So so I did a little bit of research because I never knew the venue as Three Faces. I only ever knew it as the market. Um, yeah, right. Uh, and it was Three Faces <laughs> until about 99 and then it became the market. When was your first time there? Oh, what year? Look, it must have been late 90s. So I think I was there during the transition. I think it. I just started to go uh, when it was Three Faces, but most of my time there was, was once it was the market. Um, I think the first time I heard of it was actually, so my parents moved to Melbourne in 93 uh, and my mother was an ex-beautician, so she was always like the iconic blonde-haired fag hag, you know. <laughs> so I remember her telling me that she'd gone to this awesome gay club called Three Faces and and this was the first I'd heard. Um, but then I started going there, you know, about well, 10 years later, five years later. Um, yeah, and it was just, it was the place to go. You know, I, I always felt much more comfortable uh, at queer venues. I never went out to get picked up um, generally. It was never my intention, although <laughs> sometimes that happened. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I wanted to go and just dance and I wanted to hang around people that I felt were my people um, and the straight venues were not my people. Uh, and this was even before I was, you know, on the front foot with with being queer or what they would call gender fluid now or whatever you want to call it, pansexual. <laughs> um, I just knew that, you know, straight venues weren't for me and, and a place like the market that was full of, of, of lesbians and gay boys and drag queens and androgynous types and freaky raver kids and all of those people were my people. Um, so it was, it was my second home. Hmm. And so do you remember that first time of going there and what that felt like? Look, I don't, and frankly, I, I by default, I don't remember a lot of my time <laughs> at the market, but I remember I was there a lot, so I couldn't tell you the absolute first time, um, but I can tell you that many of my longtime friends I met there. Um, I remember one night in particular where I was really, I used to be really into astrology, so I'm a Capricorn, um, and a Capricorn born really close to Christmas, so it's hard to find uh, other people around that date. And I remember that I found seven other Capricorn women who were all celebrating a birthday. I think we were, I was there late December. Um, and I just remember having like, vo you know, continual vodka shots with this tribe of Capricorn uh, women at the market. Um, and some of whom I've stayed friends with ever since. 
But it was like that, you know, you'd make an instant friend over a vodka shot and then you were friends for life after that. So, yeah, so <laughs> so many stories. It, it's hard to know where to start and, and where to stop, but I'll be guided by you. <laughs> um, and so the burning question I have uh, immediately is, did you ever go with your mum? I... Don't think so. No, I took my mother to other venues. She was a very young mum and very glamorous. So she was always a bit of a novelty hit, um, even before I got famous. But then after I got famous, then I was kind of the novelty for her because she would run around the club, you know, eating off her head and half drunk going, oh, I'm Katie Underwood's mother. And she got great (laughs) social currency out of that. Uh, for years, but she was always uh, always good company. But no, I don't think I don't think we actually went to the market together. She stopped by the time I started going out. You know, she she sort of started to settle. So that was a good thing. <laughs> so let's follow the timeline then. So you lived in London in the late nineties. No, I first visited London. I think my first trip. Let me think. It was in. I first went over there, it was it was in 99, actually, um, and I did my first recording um, that was released under the name Terra Firma over in 99. Um, so I spent two weeks over there and just I fell in love with it. Again, it, I think Melbourne and London are some of the few places in the world where I just felt instantly at home. You know, it didn't bother me that it was sort of cold and, and, and very built up. I just felt um, very much at home, but no. So I didn't live, uh, never lived in London. A lot of people ah, okay. think I sound English because my Adelaide ex- accent <laughs> sort of morphed into this other thing, and I, I don't have the broad. I don't think I have the broad Australian accent that yeah. we're often known for. Yes. So a lot of people go, oh, what? I remember flying over from Adelaide to Melbourne once on one of my many trips. My parents moved over to Melbourne three years before I did. I stayed in Adelaide. Um, and someone once asked me, oh, whereabouts in England are you from? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not. I'm 700 k's that way uh, from Adelaide. So that was kind of funny. But Oh, I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad you're saying this because this happens to me all the time. I know my accent is slightly English sounding, but every, like people never, ever clock. Everyone knows always just thinks I'm English. And I'm like, no, but yeah. it's because I grew up in Adelaide and that the accent is soft. Oh, right. You too. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. So you get it. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, so I don't know why then I thought you lived in London. I don't know. You, you were there. But anyway. again, you've, you've probably been fooled. Yeah, I was there, <laughs> but not for a long time. Oh, okay. And then so in the year 2000, something quite significant <laughs> happened in your life. Um, yes. <laughs> and that well, was... Well, then I up, up and up and moved to Sydney and joined a girl band, which was uh, crazy. Yeah, the pop stars juggernaut began mm. and uh, soon after the Bardo bomb dropped and, um, yeah, everything exploded. I went from I, – I, look, in my own defence, I will say I was already quite uh, club famous. Uh, I was, you know, one of those people that would get up on podiums and dance for hours and hours and hours, and I was pretty darn good at it too. Uh, so I did have, you know, I, I had some sort of notoriety in my own little bubble, but, yeah, Bardo blew that right out of the water and I became proper famous, <laughs> and uh, in Australia anyway. And New Zealand. And the, New Zealand. <laughs> and Singapore. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, uh, but the timelines kind of like of three faces becoming the market kind of uh, yes. align there. Yeah, it all happened around the same time. And, and I suppose that was the other reason why um, queer venues and gay venues became my second home because um, the popularity of pop stars, I mean, it was massive. It, we were famous everywhere. Um, but I simply couldn't go to a regular, what I would call a, a, a vanilla club or a straight club. I, I would just get mobbed, like, mm. and, I'm, and that's that's no exaggeration. I would walk in the door. I was highly recognisable, bright red hair. You know, you couldn't miss me really. Uh, and within seconds, I would be surrounded by um, people wanting to chat to me, have a photo, all of that, and whatever friends I were with. Um, would give up after about 10 minutes. Um, and in the end, I had to stop going out. So I said, this is ridiculous. We walk in the door somewhere and we don't see you because you're, you're, you're mobbed the whole time. Um, 
as compared to going somewhere like the market or many other venues that I enjoy going to, and there are only a couple, um, for starters, they're so dark. You know, you can't see anybody, and that's the idea. You, nobody wants to be seen. doesn't matter whether you're, uh, you know, famous or, or otherwise. Um, the thing I loved about the market is no one was there to be seen. Everyone was there to be not seen and just have a good time, whatever that looked like for them, you know, whether that was being a, a, a bar fly at the top bar, you know, sipping cocktails and, and doing shots or whether you were down in the, the dance mosh uh, floor on the, you know, sub level. Everyone was there just to just to get away from the outside world and, and not to be seen. So I love that. You know, I could walk in there and, and not be sighted for hours um, and, and I could relax because nowhere, nowhere else was like that. You're making it sound like it's a bit of a sex club, all dark and. Uh... <laughs> there, there was, yeah. Look, there, everything. There happened. was the, well, the I market. Never... Where the market? Oh, the market to me, um, it was like a universe in itself. So, um, well, I, not everybody knew this, but there was a disabled toilet just off the dance floor on the ground level. Okay. And the wall was black, and the door was black. So it was, it was one of those things that unless you knew it was there, you'd never know. <laughs> It was there, and that was the place you would go if you wanted to have sex with someone in the bathrooms. Ah, there. she says um, knowingly. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> once, <laughs> right? Once. Um, you would go in there, and you know you wouldn't have people knocking on the door, or if they did, you know you could lock it, whatever. Um, so there was there was that. Uh, so what we had the ground level, and otherwise, you know, just jammed with 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 people dancing. I was generally the mid-level. That was my favourite. So the mid-level had a lot more space. You had easy access to the bar um, and then there was that space around the balcony. So I liked room to dance and then occasionally to peer over and look at, you know, the lights and the people. Um, And then there was upstairs, although this sort of, that's right, then there was a bit that went around and there were lounges. Oh, that was the other place you'd kind of get a bit nitty gritty with people. There was like a side balcony lounge chair. Anyway, there were little zones and pockets of places. <laughs> um, yes, lots oh. of things to do. And then there was the smoking area back when that, you know, was happening. Oh, wait, hang on. Where was the smoking area? Well, they was. I think this was later before they shut it. So they built, they built out another area where you, then you'd go upstairs and they'd cram you onto this little balcony and you'd have to smoke um, up there. But otherwise, yeah, well, back in the day, you know, we were still allowed to smoke inside. So yeah. I think I was anyway. Um, I was only ever a social smoker back then. But, um, yeah, so that was always a little social hub, you know, when all the smokers are put together, everyone's having a chat and random conversations and all that stuff. I've actually just had a flashback. Once... Yeah. Uh, once I was at the market and like with with some guy on a couch next to the cloakroom and yep. this lady came up to us. I didn't know him. Like we were just t- talking. Um, and this lady asked us if we, sh- we would go to a hotel room with her and have sex in front of her. <laughs> like I've, I just completely forgot about that. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that sort of, I mean, it was just, it was one of those places, I think. Everyone just <laughs> felt like everybody else was cool, you know, and you were kind of up for up for anything. Um, I wonder it, how much I it could have one... <laughs> Yeah, well. <laughs> uh, look, one night, it's a story um, that a friend of mine was exchanging the other night, and he lived it like a couple of streets away from the market. So often, I was married at the time, but I was in a flexible relationship, so... Um, uh, we would sort of hit the market together. And generally, you know, I wasn't there to, to, to pick up, but there was this one night and we kept walking back and forth. We'd walk from the club back to his place and then back to the club and then back to some other dude's place because we wanted to have a, 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 a joint and then back to the club. And so it was this sort of in-out action all night. So we spent a lot of time walking back and forth. Anyway, on one trip between the, the guy's house and the club, we're walking along and there was already kind of a group of half a dozen of us and then there were these other couple of guys and so we started chatting to them and I assumed that they were friends of the people's house we were just at, right? You just sort of lose track. 
So we get to chatting and I just assumed they were known. Anyway, chat, chat, chat. The night goes on. People gradually leave and it's just me, my friend and this other guy. Um, anyway, then my friend goes to the bathroom and one thing leads to another. I start kissing this guy on the, on the sofa. He tells me his name and my response was, I'm never going to remember that <laughs> to this day. I never did. Night proceeds a bit further. My friend goes home. I end up using the disabled toilets with this new oh, friend of mine. Yeah, oh, oh, I mm. see. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yes. Mm. And night ends. He very, um, um, very chivalrous and walks me home. Anyway, the next day I'm telling my other friend who'd gone and it turns out this guy was just some random guy that nobody knew but we all assumed somebody knew and I'm hanging out with him like, you know, he's a known entity and, you know, kind of already been vetoed. No, no, total <laughs> random and, yeah, and still to this day totally unknown but very polite, um, yeah, which I think is what kind of had me going. But there was, it was trust, you know, I guess that was the other thing. There was this element of trust that you assumed everyone who was in there was pretty relaxed, pretty cool, pretty friendly. Um, and, and that was true. It was, it was 100% true from my experience there. And I was there on and off for, you know, 10 years. And what do you think it is about a venue that kind of creates that environment or creates that atmosphere? Uh, I think the lack of, um, you know, drunk straight men really helps. <laughs> uh, who tend to you know, veer towards either being really messy and unpredictable or really angry and unpredictable. Um, and in a gay club where, you know, people are, it's more of an ecstasy, marijuana, vodka shots, this is my friend the drag queen kind of crowd, everyone's a lot more relaxed and accepting. And I think when you're, when you feel like you're in a cultural minority and you're already getting a lot of um, criticism from the outside world, the last thing you're going to do is try and pick a fight with someone in your own community. So for me, it was just, it was that feeling that once you walk through the door, you're in a safe space. Uh, and I think everybody felt that way. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I, I got so beyond trashed so many times at the market, but I never, ever felt unsafe. Um, and I would never, ever do that in a regular club, you know, for fear of being roofied, for fear of being assaulted, for fear of, of I don't know, just getting myself in a dangerous situation. And I, I never felt unsafe and I never was, you know, in all of the crazy stories I could tell you from being there. Um, not once did anything ever untoward happen to me there. Um, so, yeah, I think that was that was the magic of it. It was our safe space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so if we're continuing to kind of follow this timeline, Bardo for you wasn't very mm. long. It was like a year, maybe a bit more. Yeah, so it was a year and a half. So I moved to Sydney late '99. Bardo exploded in 2000, and then I I'd moved back to Melbourne uh, mid 2001. Mm -hmm. um, but then, uh, you know, even though I kind of thought I was pretty famous then the year after that I released beautiful so that was then a massive club hit so then I became famous all over again and particularly in the club scene so now I had a situation where it was it was becoming difficult even to go somewhere like the market because now I really was recognized even more so in the gay scene and the clubbing scene um, so I kind of had to pick my times um, to go there but there was an understanding that there was a period there where I just I just had to accept that I would eventually get people come up and go, aren't you that girl from such and such? And, you know, people at 4 a.m. in the morning go, can I have a photo? And I'd go, look at this face. Like, no, it's 4 o'clock. Please, bitch. Like, honestly, I love you. Could you imagine that now, though, like just relentless camera phones? Yeah. But they, but, you know, but people did. They understood that. You know, if I said, look, it's 2 a.m., I'm... I've been here for four hours already, you know, please, can we not have a photo? And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course. Oh, that's good. Oh, I was going to ask what your etiquette is in terms of politely turning people down, but you're just up front. 
Oh, I had no problem with it, particularly if I'm in a sweaty nightclub, you know. I just think, look, if you, I understand, you know, you want the memory, but I'm not here to have photos. Um, so people would get that. Sometimes I'd say yes, but if I felt like I was too gone or I just wasn't in the mood, I'd go, look, you know, I'm happy to have a hug, but you're not having a photo. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I'm not. this is not a, a press conference. Um and, and, yeah, and then most people, the penny would drop. And they're like, oh, of, of course, of course, you know. Uh, and then they'd go, well, I'll buy you a drink then. I'm like, totally up for that. So, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> buy, buy me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so that, that, like, that new fame and navigating mm. that. And, and so is that because the target audience for the two, those two phases were quite different? Yeah, the, the Bardo audience was very young. Um, so even in the Bardo fame days, I could still go to, you know, my couple of favourite clubs and it wasn't really an issue. Like you get the occasional queen rush up and go, oh, my God, I love you and pop stars. And, you know, most people really didn't give a toss. Mm. Um, but then when Beautiful became famous, you know, that was the clubbing set. Then you were talking about, you know, the early 20s. Um, to 30s age group and particularly the gay market because, you know, apparently I was, you know, the gay one in the band. Um, <laughs> so, you know, naturally, woman, short hair, wears glasses, she must be gay. Um, you know, and they were half right, which was okay, which is why I never minded. Um, but, yeah, Can so we- that was kind of already my tribe. Yeah. Can we talk about that? Because I'm, I'm really interested sure. in the the tension, I suppose, that I would as, uh, imagine that you could would have felt being put in that position and, and whether there was any mm. pressure from the record label to be more feminine or, you know, traditionally feminine. Yeah, not at all. No, not at all. Look, they knew I was different from the outset. I mean, my sexuality never came up while I was in Bardo, not explicitly, um, but they realised that I was the opposite to the girls and they encouraged me to enhance that rather than fall into line. So fortunately for me, there was never any pressure to do to be less than what I was. In fact, they were like, you know what, just ramp it up, go wild, go as, go as full-blown Katie as you want to go. So that's why a lot of my, my outfits were so very different and so out there compared to you know, the glamour and the style of the girls and then I'd be wearing, you know, some freaky spacesuit with blue hair. Um, and you must have been sweaty in those outfits. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. A latex cat suit under hot lights for two hours in that film clip. I can tell you right now, when I pulled off that cat suit after shooting that clip, um, a river of water actually came out of my suit. Not, I'm not exaggerating. Like actual water came out of the suit when I took it off. So that's an indication of, of yeah, what latex does under hot lights under after like six hours. Um, but, yeah, so, I, look, it was, it was good for me. Um, and then I suppose the first time it came up in the media, you know, online, I had some fan sites. There were also some hate sites that came up, you know, the typical homophobic ranting uh, ignorant types that, you know, all lesbians must die or whatever they thought I was. Um, It didn't really bother me because, you know, I was used to that. You know, I'd had my first homophobic slur at 14 when I first cut my hair, even before I realised I was bisexual. Um, where I was first called a lesbian just for having short hair, you know. So that was the beginning of it. So it was it was nothing new for people to to make those assumptions and I, I didn't bother to qualify it at that point. Um, it wasn't until years later when I was having an interview with someone, I think it was the Herald Sun, and we were talking about stuff and and she raised something around, you know, that people thought I was gay or this or that and, and I just straight out said, well, I'm... I'm bi, I thought everybody knew that, you know, because of the way the media or the fans that had referred to me over the years, you know, I just assumed that everyone had kind of figured that out by now. Um, but apparently they didn't because the, <laughs> the newspaper then the next day ran this headline that went, Katie casually comes out. Like, <laughs> well, I was never in, you know, but fine, if you want to call that coming out, go for your life. But. <laughs> Um, yeah, it wasn't anything I ever traded on 
specifically. I just kind of assumed, well, people will think what they're going to think. Um, and I never denied it, but I didn't exactly, you know, run a PR campaign going, I'm gay and I want to sell records because I'm gay. You know, some people do that as well. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I, I never wanted to be on the front foot with it as a marketing thing. You know, to me, my sexuality was a private thing. It's like what I do with my people's my business, you know. Yeah. But like super but really heartening that the record label weren't like, oh, we've got to kind of appease mothers and fathers of young girls who are your target audience. So you need to play mm. that down. Um that's really nice to hear. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, I mean, I was only there for the first album and maybe if I'd stuck around for the second one it would have gotten more obvious. But, um, look, there, there may have been something around not mentioning, not kind of confirming or denying anything. I think as far as the label was concerned, you know, mystery was, was, a, was a good thing. Um, the one thing that they weren't keen on. But they were happy for uh, people to know that you peed on dogs. Apparently that wasn't an issue. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we should just say um, that on the on the album cover there is a yeah on the album a, a, cover a, a, totally not in real. That's not. <laughs> I, I'm, I have some kinks, but that is not one of them. Uh, yeah, the thing that the record label were not keen on was for us to talk about our partners. So uh -huh. I was um, I was partnered throughout the Bardo years, uh, and then in fact got secretly married. So. Um, yeah, they, they really didn't want us to talk about our boyfriends. They wanted, you know, girl band. The yeah. sex appeal only works if, if the public think that you're available and you're attainable. So that was the only the only thing that I remember them going, you know what, keep that on the down low ah, for the moment. Yeah. Um, but everything else I don't think they cared about. Ah. And have you had anyone get in touch with you over the last decade saying that when they were growing up, it was really good to have you as a role model. So many, oh, so wow. many. Um, yeah, so I, I think that was the other connection for me with um, particularly with the, with the gay community or LGBTIQ community, however you want to call it now, um, queer community, let's just use that word. Um, and I used to love, so in the early days I would spot these Bardo fans who didn't know yet that they were gay, but I could see so clearly. And it was both boys and girls, um, you know, baby baby lesbians, baby gay boys. Uh, and I sort of made the predictions and then often they would keep in touch with me, you know, via Messenger or websites or whatever it was back then. Uh, and then later tell me, I've just come out and thank you for leading the way. You know, I, I helped them to feel normal. So my alternative dress sense, my alternative presentation – made them feel okay mm. about about themselves, about their fashion choices, about their interests, about, um, yeah, I guess just how they felt in their skin. And I, I think the most um, uh, clear-cut case of this was I did, a, I did a, a pop stars concert. It was the first time I'd sung Poison, I think, in 18 years, and this was two years ago. And I did just a one-off um, thing in a, at a gay night in Melbourne and – this guy who was fully dressed in latex, probably about, I guess, 10 years younger than me, and I'm like, oh, my God, I love what you're wearing. He said, oh, my God. He said, you are totally to blame for this. <laughs> he said, when I was a kid, I saw that first film clip. He said, and you in that latex cat suit, he said, I was forever changed. <laughs> and since then, I, you know, he obviously became a full-on, latex fetishist he said I just I feel so good in it and you made it seem like it was okay um and I've been obsessed ever since he said and that was totally because of you um and I just laughed and we hugged and that was gorgeous and again it was just it was just one of those cases that um you know he didn't even know what he was into until he saw it and went oh wow that's unusual that's different but I love it um but you know because it was on Channel 7. It's like, oh, well, that must be okay then. <laughs> so, yeah, many, 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 many stories. And I, I feel very proud to to have kind of led the way for a lot of people in the community to just feel okay about themselves, you know. Mm. Uh, so the headline I'm taking away from this is Katie Underwood keeps the Australian latex industry alive. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I think it started a mini storm for a lot of people. Who, you know, maybe wouldn't have even thought of it. And then, you know, I, I've been I've been a member of the, the fetish community, and and one of my good friends is heavily involved in the rubber community specifically. Like that's the sub genre yeah. even within the fetish community. Um, yeah, so I'm sure this young man discovered this other community even beyond the gay community um, as well. So there's all these wonderful subcultures that exist uh, in just dressing up essentially. You know, it's fun. And do you have any friends that sit on balloons? <laughs> no, but I'm aware of that as a, <laughs> as a fetish. Like people can run whole channels, I think, and yeah. cake as well. Yes, cake. And cake yeah. and things. Yeah. And then there's this, I think, the, the modern thing that kind of uh, – that's kind of fetishy but not too freaky is this is it asmr oh yes where it's like people i don't get and it they, no well it's only supposed to affect about i think 10 percent of the population that there are particular sounds uh -huh. that will generate a very specific like tingling feeling or euphoric feeling it's like a tingle up the spine and people who are listening to these sounds Get get a jolt of of um, pleasant feeling. Essentially, uh, it's not necessarily yeah. a sexual mm. thing, um, but just this sort of heightened sensory reaction to certain sounds. When I first saw it, I didn't get it either. But I think it's one of those things that you know, if if you fall under the ASMR banner, then it's like you know, catnip for you. you just go, ah, I love this. But it's like a genetic um, thing. You can't teach yourself to do it. It's not like, no. like, so it's like magic eye. Like I could just never do magic eye. Yeah, no, you're either you're either the kind of person who responds to those sorts of sounds or you're not. It's not oh, something okay. you can, it's not like a club you can just join and go, yeah, I'll just decide. <laughs> but couldn't you like you know, train you like yourself? Being a, like being a goth, you know, you can't just put on the outfit and go, I'll just be this. No, it's a very specific subset from what oh, I'm told. I'm just Yeah, I out. know. Mm. Yeah, we'll have to join some other club. Yeah. The cake sitting club, maybe, <laughs> or the balloon people. I, just, I mean, the cake sitting club, it seems very expensive as a hobby. I mean, it's not a hobby. Sorry, I shouldn't just couldn't downgrade it to. Well, if you're into baking, maybe it's easy. You know, yeah. you could possibly crank out a cake a day. <laughs> I, I don't think you'd want to be buying them. You're quite right. It would it would become very expensive. But I don't know. See, I'm one of these people. I don't really enjoy cooking because I, I'm... Like, I, it takes me about five minutes to eat the res result of like two hours of slaving. So I always get a bit like, yeah, that, that really wasn't worth it. Um, and <laughs> and so sitting on a cake, if I spent like you know two hours <coughs> baking it, then icing it, and adding you know all these like little decorations, and then just sat on it in like ten seconds. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, I know it's not for me. So that's okay. I'll I'll move on. Um. <laughs> So, so the market, do you yes, remember hearing about it closing? Of course. Yeah. Well, we all went to the final party. I can't even remember what year it was now. Um, 2011. I think they had a, right. Okay. Um, yeah. So there were a few almost final parties. In fact, in 2011, I became a parent. So I'm not sure if I got to go to the very, very last one. Um, but I was very, very sad. I mean, at that point, the whole of Commercial Road, which is the strip that the market is in, um, was known for being the gay street in Paran. You know, we had, there was a time we had Priscilla's. I did like a whole jazz thing on a Wednesday night at a bar called Priscilla's Bar um, every Wednesday night for like three months. It was unheard of to have a jazz residency in the heart of, of, of the gay strip in Paran, but we did that. There was Diva Bar next door. Um, there was um, the market and then there was some other club as well. Um, it was a real kind of hive of activity, but around that time all of that, all of those places were being resold and straightened out and corporatized. Um, so it was, it was very, very sad. There was no other, the only other mega club that kind of matched the market uh, was the Greyhound in St Kilda. Mm. Um, that was only double level and it was still only half the size. So when the market closed, we thought, oh, well, well, we'll just steer our attention towards the greyhounds. And then a few years later, they, they bulldozed the greyhound, which was, again, total loss of an iconic venue in St Kilda. And 
they said they were going to put apartments up, but it's just been an empty block for <sighs> five years. It's just oh. been it's disgusting. It's disgusting oh. waste. Um, you know, had they had they put something up straight away, you would have gone, oh well, that's yeah. that's fine. Times change, but they knocked down this iconic venue um, that housed you know generations of of queer folk, and and there's there's nothing. It's just like a fence and a d- dirty bit of lawn. <sighs> it's very sad. <sighs> Um, at least, at least the market didn't get demolished. I think we thought that it would, and then perversely, um, quite offensively, it was reopened as a straight club. Um, and I, I don't know what upset me more. You know, I think I almost would have preferred there to be apartments there. Um, but then they reopened, and they're still open now as a, as the Emerson. Um, I've only been there twice. Um, but it just became very, very pricey, very yuppy, um, very, you know, I drive a Merc and I might own a boat and here's some cocaine, you know. It became that sort of place. Uh, it just wasn't the same. It, yeah. it just, it just, it's just like they sucked the soul out of it and, you know, put a gold star on it and went, here, we've rebranded for the, yeah, yeah it was, it was, it was very upsetting and uh, every time I'd go on there, there was no culture, there was no community there, you know, mm. it just became another money-making venue. Mm. I don't even know if it's still, well, obviously it's not happening, nothing's happening at the moment, but, um, yeah. So, Mark, at 2011. Um, yeah, so, uh, look, I, I frequented it pretty heavily, so let's see. If we go back to the timeline. So I came back to Melbourne mid-2001, 2002, beautiful, exploded. I was pretty busy working in the clubs um, for the following two years. So I was often away. Uh, so it was actually rare for me to get a weekend off where I could go out. Um, but when I could, I did. And I would grab my friend who lived in Paran and go, right, we're hitting the market. Let's have a night. Um, and we would, yeah, we would indulge ourselves and dance all night and and have a laugh and that was it and just kind of hang out until closing, which was usually four or five mm. in the morning. Mm. You know, you, you didn't walk out, you rolled out <laughs> um, and and then possibly went to some, you know, after the party down the road. Then there was, you know, Virgin Mary's, that's right, that was the other venue that would open. Let me see, what time did Virgin Mary's open? Virgin Mary's didn't open until 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. <sighs> So that was, you Sorry. know, so you, you'd, <laughs> yeah. My you'd response, like, oh, I just want to go to bed. At, uh, <laughs> yeah, you'd arrive there at six or seven, you know, having just left the last club or maybe you'd have to do a stopover at a friend's place for a couple of hours and then you'd hit Virgin Mary's and then stay there until two or three in the afternoon. You know, that was back in my wild days when, you know, sleep was just optional. Uh, and you weren't worried about yeah. having to do your washing for the following week or anything like that? No, I was not <laughs> worried about any well, of that. Well, I suppose that. when you wear latex, you just need to spray it down, right? I mean, it's <laughs> simple. Oh, no, I, I never went out clubbing in my latex. Latex was a <clears> – it was more of a, a, a private thing um, because anyone Ooh, who do knows – go on. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um. Latex, as anyone who knows, after a couple of hours, it's just all sweat. There's nothing sexy about it. Uh, Unless you carry talcum powder. Ins- that only does so much. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, on the few times that I went out actually wearing anything latex, I would last two, maybe three hours, and then I'd actually either have to get changed at the club or just go <laughs> home if I was having a, you know, just a social uh, or fetish night. You would just go. But if I wanted to dance, you know, it was runners and pants or hot yeah. pants and something very, very relaxing and, and comfortable, <laughs> maybe sexy, but generally just sort of comfortable. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so that whole commercial road, you know, Paran was very, very gay <laughs> at yeah. the time. Yeah. Is it is it no longer like that or is there, are there any remnants of that? There's only one venue now called Poof Doof. Uh-huh. Uh, which took up took up the charge. Um, don't you just love the names? It's always so <laughs> <laughs> it's so not hidden, you know. It's an open secret. Um, so Puff Duff kind of took up the charge, but there was a gap. There was a vacuum of venues for a couple of years. Um, and look, the Puff Duff venue is is okay. It's at the old Chasers, I think. So again, you've got a multi level club, lots of little dark spaces, lots of big dance floors. You know, all the stuff you want 
um, in a venue, big laser lights, drag shows, you know, good DJs, that sort of thing. Any discreet disabled um, toilets? Not for me, no. <laughs> I think I, I was starting to grow up a little then and um, obviously once I had kids everything changed and I didn't really go up much after that. But, yeah, but, but the whole but the commercial road set itself just died. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the only thing that survived was the one gay bookshop, Hairs and Hyenas, which was there for many, many years. Um, but I, I'm not even sure if they're there anymore. I think there was a fire or there's someone, of, there was this horrible incident where um, one of the owners who I think lived and worked at Hair and Hyenas got um, illegally raided by the police and had his arm broken and it was this whole case of, of mistaken identity and police brutality and he lost his case and I don't know, it was just this, uh, I don't uh, maybe they had this assumption that, oh, well, hares and hyenas must be a deviant, you know, worthy of a raid at 2 a.m. in the morning. It's just disgusting behaviour, um, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, but that was kind of mm. the last the last man standing. I think it was the last gay flag to be flying mm. in Commercial Road. Everything else had been turned into, you know, tanning salons and dentists and doctors and, I don't know what else. Not much. Uh, Nothing good. Expensive, <laughs> joyless things. Um, yeah, ex- exactly. And so then has the scene moved or is the scene just dissipated? I think it, it got split then. Um, I mean, St Kilda's always been pretty friendly, but um, even though St Kilda's very much a, a cultural melting pot, uh, it was never specifically, you know, gay. It's always been gay friendly. But it didn't have those same flagship stores mm, mm. Um, like Hairs and Hyenas or like the, you know, openly gay bars, Diva Bar or Priscilla, um, and certainly not the market. Um, so, no, I, I have not seen a cluster reform anywhere in Victoria. So it was very sad. And I think the loss of the market was, it was the last thing to go. So by 2011, all the other smaller venues had already shut up shop or moved on. Uh, so yeah, we were all sad when the market ended, not just because, uh, it, the club was shutting. It was the, it, it signified the end of an era mm. for a lot of us. Mm. And it's like, well, where do we go now? Um, and yeah, there was no sort of one gay hub anymore. There are still places to go, of course, but it's, it's not the same and I'm not sure it ever will be. Mm. Um, okay. So I'm determined not to finish on that sad note. Can I, can I ask, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, what's, what songs transport you back to the market? Oh, Rapture by IO. Oh, um, oh my God. Do you yeah. know what, I, like, oh, that, that sound. Um, oh, so many. There was um, a song called Finally. There's been lots of songs called Finally over the years, and I forget uh, who did this one? But, but it was in the days of, you know, the Ministry of Sound compilations back when they were good, um, <laughs> or even even Gatecrasher albums. So you know how that, that makes you sound of, really old. If you're like, well, back when it was good, it? before it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back before electro. Trash, in my you know, day, took over, <laughs> took over. Back when house music was a thing, you know, it's coming back apparently. But um, so. Yeah, I think it was that it was it was those big room sounds where mm. you had kind of it wasn't quite trance and it wasn't quite house, but you had this merging of the two sounds. That's just the first one that pops into my head. There'd be many more. If I opened up my computer, I could, you know, scroll through and go, Oh, it was this and it was that. <laughs> um but yeah, Rapture by Io and, and many others. Um Yeah, it was just it was that that massive room sound where people were just there to to dance. The whole dance floor would just, a certain sound of a song would come on and you'd be just transfixed and the laser lights would be going and the whole club would be screaming. I was really distressed to visit Poof Doof one night. I'd been to, surprise, surprise, a fetish dance club prior and that had wound up at about 3 a.m. and we were still, you know, keen for a dance. We thought, oh, we'll drop into Poof Doof. And I've walked in the door of this club, so this was like, I don't know, maybe two or three years ago now, so not that long ago. And I walked in and I was assaulted by the sight of a full dance floor, which firstly annoyed me because I'm like, where am I going to dance? 
But the thing that really got me was every goddamn person on that dance floor had their phone out and was looking at it. And I, I, I could not wrap my head around what had happened, apparently, in the club scene where now it was acceptable not just to have your phone on you but to have it out and be looking at on the goddamn dance floor, but, you know. And but so were they filming just, themselves having a good time or were they checking their Instagram? All of it. There were some people that were actively messaging. There were some people that might have been trying to take a photo. Um, if it was just people taking photos, I could get it. But honest to God, everyone was just like checking their socials while they were dancing, like on the dance floor. I wanted to grab them and scream and just go, why are you here? If you want to just scroll through your feed, go the fuck home and get off my dance floor and let me have a good time. It was really, really, I just, I I couldn't process it. Even now I can't process it. So, you know, for me, my memory of being at a dance club was to dance and everyone was there to have a good time. And if I even had a phone back then, it certainly wasn't in my hand. It probably wasn't yeah, in my pocket. because it was like pocket. this big. <laughs> well, you know, I'd, I'd cloak it. You know, you'd just sort of cloak your phone yeah, and yeah. forget about it. Um, you know, I barely had room to, to stuff, you know, <laughs> $50 bills in my bra so I could get a vodka, let alone carry a phone. You know, who could be bothered with any of that? Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's missing too you know how can you really be immersed in this Mm. incredible song that comes on when you're busy checking your your latest ping on your phone yeah that that put me right off you know put me right off going back um which was sad Mm. yeah but we don't want to end on that note no we don't want to end on that note but (laughs) but but, so i was gonna say i was gonna say first of all my pet peeve on dance floors is when everyone is shirtless because if they're really sweaty and gross and i have to like rub up against them i don't like that very much (laughs) yeah well that was the reason why i i i very rarely ever danced on the ground floor level because that was where all all the shirtless, sweaty boys were. <laughs> and I'm all, all for it. But like you, I don't yeah. want to be dancing up against, you know, copious amounts of anyone else's sweat, boy or girl. But so like that's that... why the balcony level, the mid-level suited me. Well, it's good that the market had a designated sweaty hot boy section. Oh, absolutely. That's what it, made was, it, so it was good. the mosh pit. It was the mosh pit <laughs> for gay boys. You know, it was just a given. If you go down there, you're not going to come away dry. You know, that's just how it was. <laughs> Um, oh, second. oh, oh, no, no, no. What I was going to say is I have a memory of there being a, a part of the dance floor that ri- like that was on some kind of engine and it would rise and fall. Did I make that up? Not necessarily. Um, there, there were certainly multiple podiums. So on the ground level, um, I think you're right. I think there was some adjustable business because they had they had <laughs> drag shows there as well. Um, <sighs> so yeah, look, I can't confirm or deny it, but I'm not going to put it out of. I think it's <laughs> it's quite possible that there were movable parts going on there. Certainly, multiple podiums of which I think I danced on almost every one at some point, often in <laughs> the same night. Well, yeah, of I course. was that sort of. Of course, I was that sort of person. <laughs> Yeah, partly to get away from all the sweaty boys, but, you know, partly because I was a bit of a show-off and I like to do that. (laughs) Well, I mean, like, yeah, if you're on a podium, you do not have to contend with someone bumping into you accidentally. You don't have to, like, navigate the dance floor. You can just go for it. Yeah, yeah. You just had to hope that, that, like, a drunk person that can't dance doesn't, in their great wisdom, decide to get on the podium there with you in that case, you know. Oh, yeah. That was always a bit a bit disturbing. I'd just go, you know what, you you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back when there's no drunken I'll, person on here. But I'll just go to the disabled toilet. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll be back in half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. if you were to describe it in five words, what would those five words be? <sighs> Sweaty. <laughs> Good. Um, vibrant. Uh, welcoming, joyful, and trashy. Oh, trashy. That's a good one. <laughs> trashy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Did you ever go to the market? Well, if you did, I would love to hear from you. Uh, tell me your stories and share any photos or anecdotes through social media. You can find me on most every platform under the username K Anderson Music. You can also find out more about what KT is up to, which includes celebrating the 20 year anniversary of Bardo, on her Instagram, which is KT Underwood Healing. Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I've been writing songs about queer venues and people who used to live their lives there, and will be releasing songs over the coming year. You can hear the first single, which is called Well Groom Boys, which is also playing underneath my talking right now on all streaming platforms. If you like this episode, I'd really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on Apple Podcasts, or just told someone who you think might be interested in having a listen to. I am Kay Anderson, and you've been listening to Lost Spaces. <laughs>